Amen. Amen. Good, good. If you got your Bible, you can turn to Mark chapter 18, uh, verse 9 through 14. I'm actually going to uh, skip around it. It's, it's, it's a parable. I'm going to be referring to a parable this morning. Uh, and really, really what a parable is, it's a story in which Jesus tells trying to get at a particular truth. And the particular truth that Jesus is trying to get at is he's trying to attack this idea of pride. So he tells a story about a Pharisee and a tax collector and does a comparison between um, both these individuals as they come into um, church. And so here we go, in verse 10. It says, two men went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men unjust, adulterer, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I have. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And today, I have to take a few more minutes, uh, my thing is why Jesus would come to church is, there you go, it's coming, there you go, is that people aren't fake, they're genuine. And really, as we come into the house of God, as we come to the church, we have an expectation, I believe that God has an expectation for every single one of us to come in being genuine, not fake. Not pretending, not hiding, not being like this Pharisee that we read about inside of the story who's telling God. They imagine that. You come into church and you tell God about how awesome you are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's just, that's just ridiculous, isn't it? But we should be coming to the, the church like, like this other, like this tax collector did and, and be like, you know, here I am, God. Here are the things that I need your help on. Here are the spots in the sense of here is where I'm vulnerable. Here is where I need help. Yeah. And see, the thing is, a lot of times we get such into the motif, especially when it comes to Sunday morning church, where we want to put on the show. Mm -hmm. And as we put on the show, what we do is maybe it's just the idea we put on the right type of outfit, we put on the right type of shoes, we put on the right type of language. It's the only time we ever talk like that. <laughs> but what I'm telling you is that God wants us to be real. Is that when we walk through these doors, the world needs us to be real. Because as we're real and we get the healing and the help that we need, we can actually go out into the world and actually make a difference. Yes. And see, I, you know, it's, it's very funny because as I was sitting back there, with that kind of a thought that kind of went through my mind. And, and you guys that have daughters, you know exactly where I'm about to go. But there is this time, which I don't know what happens, but all of a sudden a spirit of dress up comes over my house. Where, you know, I, my, my girls, they begin to put, put like makeup on the thing, on their eyes, and on the, what's that, it goes everywhere. And like, they look more like a clown than a princess, but they're pretending like they're a princess. You know, they put on their mother's high heels, and they're walking around the house in like this long dress. And it's just like, just their hair is all done. It is a land of pretend. Mm. <laughs> you know, and then they begin, my, my middle one begins to talk, she's like, yeah, I'm gonna pick you up at your house, and you come over to my house, and we're gonna hang and I'm like, no, 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 all put together, pretending I had the most horrible day of my life. Oh, God bless you. Oh, how you doing? You know, and it's just ridiculous. But God is saying, you know what? We need to be those people that are genuine. Those people who, when, when it comes down to the nitty gritty of it, hit up and say, we come to church and we say, God, I need you. God, in this moment, I just want to be genuine inside of this moment. And, and I believe that that's the type of church in which Jesus will show up in is a church that's just real. A church that understands that where each and every single one of us has ups, we have downs, yeah. we have lefts, we have rights. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we're not trying to put on a show mm. of saying, how loud can I shout? How loud can I how, how, how high can I jump? How many amens can I put into the sermon? All that type of stuff. No, no, just people that are real. 
and that understand that they are dedicated and committed to fulfilling the plan in which God has for their life. Check out this video. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Son of God who, for reasons I'm not worthy of, has sought to have a relationship with me and transforms me with that relationship, changes me, gives me grace and mercy that humbles and empowers me. And my life is forever changed in His presence. It's got to learn to stay there. So what is Jesus to me? Jesus is my Lord and Savior. He's the Son of God. He's the person that I can uh, give things to that I know that I can't control, that I can't do. So that's what Jesus is. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. He's my everything. Jesus to me is peace, salvation, and guidance. I would say Jesus is the of What Jesus uh, means to me, simply put, is that uh, He's my first love, He's my Savior, and uh, hold on for a second. Hold on for a second. Hold on. Jesus come to church and my item is that Jesus will come to church because it is an inclusive place. It is not exclusive. Amen? Amen. It is not exclusive. So let's look at a couple of scriptures that are about to pop up on the screen. Just a moment. There we go. Matthew 21. Um, 42 says, Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it was amazing in our eyes. And then Acts chapter 4, verse 11, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, and it has become the cornerstone. You know, as I reflect on my childhood, I am often reminded of, of the feeling of rejection, right? And I was reminiscing and I said, you know, I don't think any child grows up and says, I want to be rejected by <laughs> folk, right? Nobody embraces the, the humiliation and the pain of rejection. In fact, most of us spend most of our time trying to figure out how we're going to fit in with folk, right? But here we see that um, this first, first time you hear this kind, of, this kind of phrase in the Bible is actually in the Old Testament. Um, this stone which the builders rejected became the chief stone or the bronze stone as it relates to the children of Israel. Then in the New Testament, it appears in relation to Christ. And I, and I found this very odd because we have a fully human, fully divine Savior who, for all intents and purposes, I believe, what does it look like for creation to reject its creator? It's like an oxymoron, like bittersweet. And then as we look at scripture more closely, we actually find that Jesus doesn't seem to mind being rejected. And I wanted us to just spend just a few minutes thinking about why this might be. So we look at another passage of scripture, Philippians chapter 2. It says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. There's a whole lot of these three verses, right? But if we think about God becoming and what that really means. The humility of that. Immortality wrapped in mortality. The divine wrapped in human flesh. 
flesh. Like this is like the ultimate kind of humble thing you can do. And then Jesus doesn't just come and become human. Jesus becomes the lowliest of humans, right? Jesus is wearing, you know, woolen flax more so than silken gowns. And, you know, he doesn't have beautiful leather bound, um, leather bound sandals. He doesn't even have a place to lay his head. He doesn't invest in a house, right? He travels from place to place. And he begins to rub shoulders with people who would be considered the world's rejects. He dines with people who are called extortionists. He heals, he uh, forgives the sins of people that they call whores. He heals lepers, people that folk would never touch, who are actually not even allowed to be around civilization. You know? And so he does this in a way that says that he was not trying in any way to break into the elite circles of this world. And how contrary that is to the world that we live in. How often we try to gain more status. Mm. Rise ourselves above others. Right? Prove that we are better than. Uh -huh. Right? Make more money. And don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with being successful. Right? Jesus is just saying by virtue of how he walked and lived in this world that the value of human life extends to all humans. Yes. And he could not do that unless he went to those who were the poorest, who were the sickest, who were seen as the most sinful, as if no one else had sinned. I once heard a story or recollection about Mother Teresa. She was invited to speak at some uh, company event, and the time came and passed for her to arrive. The event planner got really nervous and started calling around and looking for her, found out that she was about a block away. He finds her, goes to her, she is sitting in an alley on the ground with a man who was sick and homeless, her, his, um, his head is on her lap and she is saying comforting words to him. And he walks up to her very respectfully but in a very excited and exasperated manner, if you can imagine, you have a plan speaker didn't show up. <laughs> he says, Mother Teresa, uh, you do remember that you were supposed to speak for our event today. She says, yes, I remember. Yeah. And she looks up at him and she says, this is my speech. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite authors, uh, Philip Yancey, says that he believes that both Mother Teresa and Gandhi understood that the direction of charity is not condescending, but it's us in it, that in serving those who are the weakest and the poorest among us, we have the privilege to serve God himself. I would take it a step further. I would say it is in part what makes us human. I would say it is what separates us from the wild, barbaric actions of other animals. That if we cannot see every human being as being valued and loved by God equally, then we ourselves live, lose or even give up a part of our humanity. Right. And the truth of the matter is we do it every day. Even, even those of us who don't want to catch it, even me. If I can be transparent for a minute, right? Even when we do good stuff with folk, we, we find conspicuous ways, conspicuous ways to let people know we did it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, try to find ways to tell it. Well, I remember when um, Hurricane Tr Katrina hit and we were uh, traveling down, I was traveling down with several of my friends and one of my spiritual brothers and, you know, in my mind, whether consciously or unconsciously, I thought I was going to score a brownie points with God, right? I was unemployed. I'm like, okay, I'm going down. I don't have any money myself, but I'm going to help people who have less than me. I'm going to come back. I'm going to get a job, right? Jesus is going to put me up because I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, right? This is my mentality. I'm going to go help the little people, right? And none of us want to really say it, but we think it, and we, we infuse it into our actions. So I'm, I'm going to this house, and there's this family here, a beautiful family. It's like a duplex. They have cinder block walls. They have concrete floors. And there's two little girls. The oldest girl's name is Nora Saul. Sweetest children you ever want to meet. They are dressed in all the clothing they have and all the jackets they have, because there's no heat in the house. And this is like December. And they are sleeping on a mattress that is placed directly on the concrete floor that is damp and wet. And so we spend some time there with their family, finding out what are some of their needs and how we can maybe meet some of their immediate needs. And I'm spending time with the kids because I'm always drawn to kids. 
And after it's over, we're standing around talking, and Nora Saul walks up to me, and she says, here, she hands me her teddy bear. And this girl only has like two or three items that she owns. And she says, I want you to have this. And in that moment, anything that was in me that was arrogant or better than or greater than melted away because I saw the face of Jesus in the face of that little girl. And I knew in that moment God had not brought me there to help her, but it brought me there because she needed to help me. Right? There was a flip, there was a switch, there was a change. Something that I had let go of in my humanity was given back to me through the actions of someone who God loved just as much as God loves me. So the question becomes, why is it that we constantly try to break into elite circles when God is calling us to break into circles that the elite usually would not be caught dead in, right? And what does it mean to serve a Christ that says that all of you, no matter where you are in life, no matter what you have done or haven't done or how you live your life in this moment, I want you all to be a part of my body. What does that look like to live together and to learn from one another and to respect each other and to grow and to be empowered to do change in this world? God left us a promise. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone... Not some people. Anyone hears me and opens, then I will come into them and I will dine with them and them with me. The church is not an exclusive place. We may be set apart, we may do some things differently, but it's not exclusively a club, apart from the fact that we all admit that we are sinners saved by grace. Amen? Amen. Number nine is we kind of wrap up our uh, our time of preaching and teaching today. Matthew chapter number nine. So we've we've heard a lot about uh, why people will come to church and and uh, even we've talked in the last few moments of why Jesus would come to church and it's it's often about perhaps what uh, characteristic is at work uh, in us as a reason for coming to church or a reason why Jesus would come to church. But I want to talk for a few moments of why I think Jesus would come to church and the action he would perform why, when he would come. And I believe that Jesus, when he comes to church and why he would come to church, is to heal all of us that are in here. That Jesus will come to church to work on us. Jesus will come to church to work on you. Tell your neighbor, he's coming to work on you. You, you, you. Come on, just point out and tell him, you. Right, you, you. It, it, do I have any honest folk in here that, that can say that I am a work in progress for God? All right. And for the few of you that didn't raise your hand, uh, if I were you, I would move away from them, praise God. Because obviously they are not aware. Amen. But anyhow, or maybe you just want to stay next to them and make them aware. But, but, but the case is still true that Jesus would come to church because he wants to heal all of us. Which makes me believe a couple of things. Number one, that we that are in church are sick. That we got some problems. We got some struggles. We got some issues. We got some enigmas, some dilemmas. We got some conundrums. We got some stuff that only Jesus can address. Yeah. And Jesus will come here uniquely to help Even the way, somebody said. 
say amen. If you can't find Jesus here, you better go find find a place where you can find Jesus. Because I don't want to be nowhere where Jesus is not. Because when Jesus shows up, he comes to heal us. To make us whole. Matthew chapter number 9. It's a great particular passage because it is Jesus! 
stand straight up. Oh, you know that would preach too, but I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that a little later too. And, and, and then you find another example in John chapter number 5 when, when Jesus is on his way to the temple and he's passing through the inner courts of the temple and he goes by a pool named Bethsaida and you have all these folk around the pool laying there, paralyzed folk, blind folk, lame folk, and we don't know why in this story Jesus fixates on one, but one of these individuals, the scripture says, And Jesus, on his way to the church, looks at this paralytic man and he says, do you want to be made well? And he says, yes. And Jesus tells him, pick up your bed and walk immediately. He springs up his bed and he walks. I got to tell you, when I read all these passages, it just seems to, to drink dry. But I've been told that's not true. 
But you know, some introverts, you know, you know, aren't necessarily trying to be out there like, da, like they came in a five heart beat. Y'all excuse me, I just got it.
ask you this one question. Do you want to be made well? Ain't it something that before Jesus healed this brother, he asked him first, do you want to be made well? That may seem like a rhetorical question. Of course I want to be made well. But some of us, keep it real, we like our illness. We've gotten used to this dysfunction. Sometimes the devil I know is better than the devil I don't know. <laughs> How about meeting Jesus? I, I bet Jesus is better than that devil you know. Mm -hmm. Do you want to be made well? Do you want to deal with your bad attitude? You just want to keep coming to church for 38 years.